I have welcome to yet another tutorial in which we are still diving now deep into cathode ray uh, tube topic, is basically our topic number seven, rays and cathode ray tube. I'm your tutor, Dimi Joseph Adeli. Before we begin, we shall have a quick word of prayer. Father, Lord in heaven, we invite in this session that you may be able to guide us in this tutorial as we work on this topic i pray that you may guide us just may pray amen so basically just to go back over our specific objectives by the end of this topic you should be able to describe production of cathode rays which i believe you can because in the previous tutorial we were able to cover this also, you should be able to state the properties of cathode rays. We discussed five properties of cathode rays. I believe you can state all of them. Now, we are going to start working on explaining the functioning of a cathode ray oscilloscope or a CRO and a television tube. That's basically what we are going to begin working on this tutorial. And then you should also be able to explain the issues of cathode ray oscilloscope, which shall now come later in the next tutorial together with solving problems involving cathode ray oscilloscopes. So today we are going to look at explaining the functioning of a cathode ray oscilloscope the television. Then the last two shall be covered in the next tutorial. So basically, a cathode ray oscilloscope, a cathode ray oscilloscope or a CRO is development of a cathode ray tube. We look at how a cathode ray tube operates and so that the cathode ray tube has some various parts whereby we said it has an evacuated bulb or simply a bulb that is a vacuum. It also has an anode, it's a cathode, it has a heater. We have the extra high tension circuit. So there are various number of parameters that we looked at that give the cathode ray tube. Now basically we want to look at an advancement of a CRO so that we see now, based on the various simple CRT that we had, the cathode ray tube, now how does a cathode ray oscilloscope look like? It's basically the same theory, only that now it's an advancement of that basic theory. So the cathode ray oscilloscope, it consists of the following parts, an electron gun, the deflection system, and the spin. So basically you noticed in the previous tutorials, we looked at the CRT, the cathode ray tube, and we noticed that there was a screen. I believe you can notice from this diagram a screen. Let's just begin from the basics. There was also a cathode and there was an anode. Now these other things seem that they are not there because we want now to start explaining of what basically entails each one of and every one of them and why each of them is at that specific point. Why are they there? We are going to explain each and every of these parameters. So number one, you can notice that this cathode, there's also a grid. Why this a grid? We shall also look at that. There's also an anode, but notice that this anode is kind of two parts. We shall look at why there are two parts of them. We also have an input, two plates, an input plate here, and there are two plates. There are also two plates here, the time base plate. If you notice the terms there, we also have an extra high tension source here. We have a negative a thousand volts. Why is it negative? It's quite clear to notice that it's negative. We also see why it's negative. We also have a negative 500 volts. Why are these connections specific points? Why is this one zero and this one's a negative? We shall look at all of them bit by bit. So let us begin by the electron gun. Now, in the previous cathode ray tube, if you just review your notes, you'll notice that this the element whereby we have the heater and the cathode, they produce, they give out the the electrons so basically that part if i just come here it is similar to this part uh-huh it is similar beginning from the cathode here here all the way to the anode why we pick it up with the anode, we shall look at that. So this is the part of the electron gun. Or basically, if you notice, 
there is some similarities between this and the cathode ray tube. Just try getting those small links you are on and then try comparing with what will be giving us the actual data. We also have the deflection system, this part. So part number two is the deflection system. Part number one is basically the electron gun. And then part number three, we have the screen. So those are the three main parts that we have. We are going to explain each and every one of them. The electron gun. Now, the electron gun supplies electron. That's some one. Number two, accelerates them towards the screen and focuses the beam to a point on the screen. That's the electron gun. Those are the three main uh, uh, functions that it plays. Supplying electrons. That is the work of the cathode. We are going to look at deeply how it functions. Also accelerates them towards the screen. And then number three, focusing them to a point on the screen. So it consists of one heated cathode, or basically just a cathode, and then the heat part comes from the filament. So there's no need of just stating heating cathode. It's basically a cathode. Heating heated cathode simply means that it's being heated by the filament. Number two, we have the grid, and you have the anodes. Each of them plays a specific role in each of these points. Now that's basically our electron gun in a simple way. We have just wrapped up everything. So we have each of these parameters like this. Let us just begin basically the uh, fun elements that we have. One, cathode. The cathode supplies the electrons from what we, have, what we are able to look at as we are building up for this section. So it supplies the electrons how? It basically is heated by the filament, and after it's heated, the electrons are dislodged because of a lower work functions. And why do we say it has a lower work function? The metal is coated with oxides, and the oxides, so, uh, we know that there are basic types of oxides, not all oxides. So it not come up with, for example, sodium oxide, and say that it can be applied without potassium oxide. That's not true. We can only have barium, strontium, or thorium oxides because they are preferred of their low work function. So the lower functions, if you just remember from the previous tutorial, we say that low uh, work function is simply the, amount, the minimum amount of energy that is required to dislodge an electron on a metal surface. And basically, we indicate it's minimal. It's lower than other oxides and lower than most metals. So that's why we have to it there, so that we can minimize the amount of energy that is used on that particular substance. Now, I believe you can notice the cathode here. This part is the cathode. The one that has been C. That's the cathode. Next, we have this thing. This is what we call the grid. That's what we term as the grid. That. This thing that comes like this and it has an aperture here. So it's called as the grid. Then you have the anode there. So the grid controls the rate of flow of electrons. Why does it control the rate of flow of electrons? Notice in the previous CRT, there was no grid. So the electrons will just flow, they, they are not controlled. Why and is it controlled? We shall also look in a short while. How does it control the rate of flow? But right now, just know that it controls the rate of flow of electrons. The anodes has two tasks. Accelerates and focuses the electron beam on the screen. So one part of the anode accelerates the electron beam. And then the next focus is the electron beam on the screen. How it works? This is how it works. They consist of cylinders and disks maintained at high positive potential relative to the cathode. Now, I would like to you, uh, you to be able to notice this. Notice that the cathode is connected to a negative 1,000, yeah, negative 1,000, because it comes at that point, so negative, negative 1,000 volts, and that's the negative part, and then the anode is connected at higher potential. Now, which and which does which specific role, shall explain that. So notice both of them are connected at a higher potential. A positive potential. So the difference in this causes that particular acceleration and those particular terms. Now on the grid, there's a difference here. 
the grid, notice the first part is connected to a 500 volt potential, negative 500, and the other part is connected to negative, negative 1000, the cathode. So, the two cause some difference, or some electric field. Now, notice both of them are negative. So if they are negative, it means there's a repulsion that occurs. Now, if it, the repulsion also occurs, you shall notice that because of the difference in the potential, so this one is slightly more positive than the other one, so there shall be some passage of electrons. There are some that will pass, others will be returned. So that is the basic idea that we have here about the anodes and the grid. Uh -huh. So with that, so we have seen that the anode and the cathode have a, pose, a potential difference of potential difference in, in them. So they attract. So as they attract, the grid tries to regulate them. And you have just had a hint of how it regulates because of the slight change or the slight difference in potential differences between the cathode and the anode. Now let us begin by the first part, the focusing of the beam. But maybe I can just have something maybe to add on. So you find that the anodes, they consist of cylinders and disks maintained at high positive potential to the anode. They therefore attract emitted electrons and eventually direct them to the screen. That's it what we have now, focusing the beam. We have this particular diagram in which we shall be able to use to explain about focusing the beam. So notice the cathode is connected here. So with that connection, there's a difference, there's a potential difference between the anode and the cathode. Now let's start with the first um, in, uh, with the first anode, A2. Notice A2 is connected at point P, uh, the potential difference point, uh, the, uh, at point B. Uh -huh. So at point P, Notice that there's a diverging beam. Why a diverging beam? There's a, an electric field at this point, and then electric field, the moment it attracts those particular ejected or the electrons that have been released from the metal surface, they, uh, they tend to move towards the anode. Now, as they move, they are accelerated due to the potential, the uh, electric field. So they gain kinetic energy towards the anode. So as they move, A2 attracts them more. But the moment they reach here, there's a slight interface that happens. There is this first anode A2 and another anode A1. Anode A1 is at even a higher potential difference than A2 because A2 is on a rheostat, and the rheostat, you know, that the task is to be able to regulate the voltage or the power flow. So, as it because it can regulate and even at a lower voltage difference, this one is at zero volts. A1 has even a higher voltage than A2, meaning this potential difference or an electric field that flows from A1 to A2. And that is what you can notice with these arrows moving from a, the top of A1 to top of A2 and bottom of A1 to A2. So as they move, they compress those the diverging beam. So as it, the moment the diverging beam keeps on diverging, it reaches here, the electric field compresses them. So as it compresses, they start again diverging. They start converging now. And you'll notice now that gives us the two tasks of the anode. A1 will accelerate the electro electrons, whereas A, uh, that's A2, whereas A1 will be able now to focus the beam towards the screen. That's basically the tasks that we have. So notice the greater potential difference between the anodes A1 and A2, the greater the electric field intensity and therefore the greater the degree of focusing. So the moment we increase the potential difference between A1 and A2, the greater the focus of the beam. 
This potential difference can be varied at point P as I've explained to produce the desired degree of focusing. So the more intense that particular potential difference is, meaning I've moved P to the left hand side, while to the left hand side I'm getting it more negative, and the moment it becomes more negative, there shall be a stronger attraction or a stronger electric field between A1 and A2, and that shall cause the beam to be focused more because they shall be the electric field shall push upwards. So that's why we are saying the greater the position difference between the anodes A1 and A2, the greater the electric field intensity, and therefore the greater the degree of focusing. So the potential divider, or basically what I termed as the rheostat, so they all term the do the same thing. Potential divider is focusing, is the focusing knob on the control panel. So as I move the potential divider either left or right, there's a difference of potential, there's a potential difference that is caused, and that acts as the focusing knob because I'm directly affecting the focusing of the beam. Let us go to the grid. The grid, we have noticed that the grid is simply this part here, that part. That is the grid. So, how does this particular grid work? So, the moment the electrons are ejected and they're being accelerated by the anode A2, this, anode, this grid here is at slightly a lesser negative potential to the cathode. This light negativeness, because all of them are negative, now we remember from electrostatics that unlike light charges repel. So we expect them to repel, but there's a difference in their negatives. If they were equal, they'll just totally repel off. But because there is a small negative, meaning there's some positiveness, there's a value of positive, uh, the grid has a higher number of positives than the cathode, there shall be a slight attraction, but of it is that it shall repel some negative charges and others shall be allowed to go. This basically tells us that the grid regulates the amount of electrons that passes or crosses towards the screen. So that's the main thing that you know. It controls the rate of flow of electrons. But there's something that affects the, uh, there's something that is affected when that the number of electron flow is controlled, either by increasing it or reducing it. Let us get what happens. So the grid is a hollow cylinder surrounding the cathode having a small hole. You can notice that small hole. So this cylinder is a small negative is at a small negative potential relative to the cathode, so as to allow some electrons to flow, whereas others are repelled. So the moment electrons, we know that electrons will move in very large beams. So others will be repelled, whereas a very narrow beam will be allowed to move. And the moment it reaches the anode, we know that there shall be a diverge. But the moment it reaches it with that, there shall be a converge. That we have explained why it happens so. Now, let us just explain what happens. Now, what will be the observed thing on the screen when they, they control either an increase in the rate of flow of electrons or a decrease in the rate of flow? So it is used to control the intensity of the beam in that when the grid is made less negative, more electrons cross over. And when made more negative, the number of electrons crossing over the beam is cut down. So basically, the moment we allow more electrons to flow, that means we reduce the potential difference between the two, between the grid and the, the cathode, there shall be and great amount of electrons flowing. And that tells there's something that shall be observed on the screen. And if we increase the potential difference between the grid and the cathode, there shall be a lower number of electrons. Uh, we shall have the number of electrons flowing increased. So that's what we are having this statement that it is used to control the intensity of the beam, in that when the grid is made less negative, that means. We move it to the right. I believe you can notice this from this. When you make it less negative, it's at a negative, negative 500. We just move it this side, it 
so that we did make it less negative. I stated that we uh, re uh, reduce the potential difference. In fact, we are increasing we are increasing the potential difference such that the positiveness is increasing. The positives are increasing. That's what we mean by the negative being reduced. So positives are increasing. So that's what we have by increasing the positives or increasing the potential difference between the grid and the cathode. The amount of electrons flowing increases, but if we reduce the potential difference the amount of electrons are cut down. Now, what is observed on the screen, notice that the properties of cathode rays is that it causes a fluorescence. And that fluorescence is what is observed on the screen. So the higher the number of electrons flowing, the more bright the image or what is formed on the screen. So the grid therefore controls the intensity of the beam and hence the brightness of the screen. So the brightness knob Controls, uh, uh, controls a potential divider, which varies the potential difference between the grid and the cathode. Let us move to the deflection system. This basically entails a vertical deflection, uh, vertical deflection or simply what term as Y-plex. Now, with this, we find that we have a figure here now. Whereby we saw the first kind of plate, which we term now as Y plate. So as the electron beam is flowing, what will happen in this case? Notice the term circuit here. So when the beam passes between uncharged horizontal plates that we have as Y1 and Y2, uh, it strikes the screen at point A. Why does it strike the screen at point A? Attraction or repulsion force between these plates. Notice if we close down this particular uh, circuit, Y1 shall become positive because it's connected to the positive terminal, and Y2 shall become negative. So there shall be no attraction because there is no charge between those two plates. The circuit is open. So when the switch is closed, the plates become charged and the beam is attracted towards the positive plate Y1. That is it will be deflected towards point B. Now, if the polarity of the plates is reversed, that means I change the direction, this point becomes negative one, and this side becomes negative. That means I want to switch the negative sign and the one to the positive sign. We shall find that the spot will shift to C through A. Now, how that one happens currently quite different because here we are having an AC source but now to make it more frequent we'll use something called an AC source generating current so that we don't start affecting the attraction or we don't have a problem with the uh, shifting of the polarities of that particular battery. So if the if the reversals of the polarities are sustained the spot will shift from B to C and back at the frequency of the reversals. So if you have a DC, for example, the moment I'll change, I swap and I swap, the difference in that interchange shall be the same speed or the same frequency in which you shall be able to notice the spots shifting on the screen. Now, what if we use an AC source, alternating voltage or alternating current, the spot moves up and down in accordance with the inter instantaneous voltage at the frequency of the AC. This is usually a specific uh, alternations. So the frequency in which it will alternate with is the frequency in which we are able to observe the spots moving on the screen. So if the frequency is high enough, a vertical line is observed rather than moving spot due to resistance of vision. Because our eyes will not be able to notice very fast frequencies, we just notice a straight line. But the moment you can be able to slow down the speed, you'll notice that it's moving at a specific speed. But the moment the frequency is very high, we shall just observe a specific line because of distance of vision. Since plates form deflection in the vertical direction, they are called Y plates. So the signal is fed uh, is fed in through the Y input terminal of the CRO. That's something you need to note. Let's go to the horizontal deflection or what we call the X. Plates. Now, in this case, when 
will have this particular arrangement. So if you have that arrangement, the beam of electrons is diffracted horizontally across the screen from points M to points N. I believe you can notice points M and point N. Let me just use some of my pointer here in that direction. So we shall have them shifting that way, depending with where you began from. Why? Let's start explaining. Uh, to M and back as the polarities are reversed. Believe from that, from the explanation, we have noticed how. Because we shall have this side as positive, for example, the first case and negative the other side. So, depending with how you play up with the polarities, you shall be able to shift them to M and N and back, M and N and back to the frequency still. So, since the deflection is horizontal, the plates are reversed. I would like you to, the same way I've explained the vertical deflection of the Y or the Y plates, try explaining the X plates and see on what we have. And try forwarding it to me so that you see how to get a very good ex detailed explanation of that. Now, in the CRO, a voltage varying as in the figure that you're going to see next is applied to the X plates from a special circuit known as time base. Let us introduce that time base. Now, if we have this particular diagram, that simply gives us the graph of what we term as the time base. It's a space, special circuit in which it is applied to these particular X plates. Notice we say in the first case, if you have Y plates, you'll, not, you'll connect it to the Y input terminal. In this case, now we are having now a special circuit called the time base. Time base simply means it is time, it applies, it plays up with something called, that, uh, called time. Or basically, we know that the X, the X axis of the graph usually has what we term as independent variables. Time does not depend on any other aspect. But the anything that you put on the y-axis, you know that it's dependent on a particular variable. So time does not depend on any other variable. So the voltage increases uniformly. So it will start, for example, at negative, negative y. It starts at a specific pole, depending on the polarity that is there. So for example, it's it beginning at negative and you may begin at positive. So if it starts from negative, it simply means, for example, in this case, I'm having it, for example, beginning at N. So if my point begins at N, the voltage increases uniformly to the peak, or is basically what we term as the sweep. So it increases up to this point, what we term as the sweep. That line like that up to M, which basically the sweep then drops suddenly to the uh, suddenly, which we term as flyback. That is basically how it is designed. It goes up, then immediately down, up, immediately down, up, immediately down. So that is it. It's not a normal curve up and down, gently curving like that. No, it's a up and immediately down perpendicularly. So let us get its diagrammatical explanation from our diagram here. So as the voltage rises, we said it begins from point N. For example, in the, our diagram, we are beginning from the negative side. The, no, the negative side will start from M because it's negative, it's affected the positive side. So beginning from M, the spot moves horizontally at a uniform speed until the peak voltage is reached. So as the polarity increases, it shall tend toward the further point, point M, because now we are increasing the polarity. So as the voltage increases, it's attracted more and more and more and more and more toward point M. So it goes further with point M toward the other side. But the moment it reaches the sweep, or basically the peak, uh, it drops immediately. And notice that will go at a uniform speed until the peak voltage is reached. So the time base voltage then drops suddenly to the maximum negative value. So notice the maximum negative value, the graph simply shows us that it goes to the lowest point. And notice from linear motion, we are able to see, because it started from negative and moved up, it moves to the opposite direction, and then moves down to the opposite direction of where it had reached. So if it had gone further to point M, from a point, let's say, like O, and it went far, M and then directly drops to a lower negative value, it means it shall drop and even go further. 
through point zero and go to the opposite side which is point n. That's basically what we have. It shall go to the opposite side of the screen or the end of the screen in the opposite side. So the voltage builds up again and the process repeats again. So it shall move again from n back to the n and then come back again. So it shall move them uh, like that depending on the frequency of your time base. Now the sweep of the spot across the screen can be adjusted using the time base control knob which operates the frequency of the time base voltage that is observed in the CRO. So unless you go to how CRO is the diagram, you shall, be able to, you shall not be able to appreciate much of what the time base is. So try to check up the pictures of how a CRO looks like and you shall notice the time base control knob. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the sweep. The sweep, you can notice that. We explained how the sweep comes about. It simply comes about the period. It's slightly similar to a period, but not really a period. The period just can help us appreciate much of what we mean by the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the sweep. Typically, values are 10 millisec milliseconds per centimeter or 100, millis and 100 milliseconds per centimeter. All this I'm explaining is simply in your KLB textbook. You can pl please go about and check that. So when the time of sweep is long, that means the time base is at a very low frequency. The spot moves slowly on the screen. But if it, the time base, the, if the sweep is very, very high and very short, the frequency is very high, it means the speed is very high. The, the, speed, the, the speed in which the spot will be moving will be very fast. Now, let us take the two scenarios in which it's moving very slowly and very fast. The eye can follow the spot as it crosses the screen. That's when you have it very slowly. When the sweep is long. So in that case, we shall be able to observe the following diagram. We shall just observe a spot moving all the way until wherever it will reach and then back again and then back again and then back again, whatever it is. All this will happen in a straight line. What I'm just saying is that the value shall be shifting. But if the frequency is raised to reduce the time sweep, let's say 10 milliseconds per centimeter, the movement of the spot gives a permanent trace of a horizontal line across the screen. They shall be, uh, they shall be dots moving <coughs> across the screen, but it shall be very fast for the human eye to detect it. So you should just have a horizontal line on the screen. That's basically what happens. But we can have something more else now to this. Because now you want to observe a very good screen, very good diagram on the screen, we shall now combine both the X plates and the Y plates together, whereby we'll say now we have a simultaneous application of AC at Y plates and time base at X plates. So we are having an AC because we, are, we don't want to keep on changing the terminals manually, but the AC shall be able to help us turn it. So we are advancing now. In this case, now we have both plates, the X plates and the Y plates together, whereby they shall still serve the same purpose from the advancement of our CRO previously in which we had them achieve several points. So simultaneous application of the input voltage at the Y plates and the time base voltage leads to the movement of the spot on the screen in two dimensions, producing two-dimensional image. So we have that. So for example, spots one, the spot, yes, will move towards in the X axis and also move in the Y axis. So Instead of moving only horizontally, there's also an affection due to the Y plates because it's, at a, it's, at an, uh, it's under the influence of AC. So the spot can move towards the, uh, in the horizontal manner with the horizontal sweep again. So it shall form an image, for example, in this case, a curve, depending with the way you are spot moving or the way you have designed it to move. So in the image there, we, have, we can observe an AC signal is supplied across the Y plates as the time base is on. Both of them, the AC signal and the, the time base are on. So that is a simultaneous application of the AC and the Y plates and the time base at the plates. Now let's go to the last section, which is the screen. Now, the screen is coated with fluorescent substance such as zinc sulfide called phosphor. 
Now, phosphor, it glows on impact with electrons. That's something you need to note. For it that you are speaking about phosphor, it has a persistence of 0 0.5, 0 0.05 seconds. That is, it continues to glow even after the beam has passed the point of impact. Now, let me just give you a very good illustration of this. I believe you have, ever, you have come into contact with old TV sets. You know it? They, the old TV sets, they applied something known as CRO steel. So this CRO, the moment you switch on the television, you'll notice that if you switch it off abruptly, it shall take time to switch off. So this a time it takes before it goes off. That's what it simply means. So this plus the natural persistence of vision of the eye makes a waveform to be observed on the screen. So the inside of the tube is coated with graphite, which has three specific functions. Number one, conducting the electrons to the earth. That simply means earthing so that the moment they hit the screen, they don't remain on the screen. They are earthed. Number two, shielding the beam from external electric fields. They can be external electric fields that can disturb our image. So it shields that. And number three, accelerating uh, the, ele the electrons towards the screen since it has the same potential as the anode. So success in your preparations, that was basically what you are able to cover this time. May God bless you abundantly. In the next tutorial, we shall look at the uses of the CRO.